Hello and welcome to the next rankings video. A quick thank you to those who contributed to the poll. I will continue to use it to guide the release order of this series. And after looking over the results at the time of this video's pre-production, it's time to move on to the only Xenos faction that has come close to destroying the Imperium. So without further ado, let's get to it. Ranking the Orc Clans. This is the disclaimer segment. For those familiar with the format structure, feel free to jump ahead. And while you're doing so, assuming you enjoy my content, why not subscribe to my channel and like this video? It would be absolutely appreciated. For those who haven't seen the previous ranking videos, here's the skinny. These videos are not geared to be a top 10 tier list. It's not trying to advocate which sub-factions are definitively the best or worst. It instead will paint a picture of each faction's playstyle on the tabletop, demonstrating how each sub-faction's mechanics skew. Basically, the goal is to show the differences which I think is pretty useful for players out there who are looking to build a new army and are curious to see if a particular sub-faction will feature a mechanical style to their preference. Also, I've dropped the methodology segment from this video. My rationale here is that I don't want to be repeating the same speech on methodology with every rankings video that gets released, as it needlessly adds to the runtime. Instead, I will only include a methodology segment if there is a change to the process. So if you want to see the methodology used in this video, check out the previous one, link up top. Now, let's head over to the ranked results. So, here's how to read these charts. For those familiar, feel free to jump ahead to the results breakdown. The number beside each chart's label refers to the number of qualifiable mechanics that were able to be evaluated based on the methodology described earlier. Relating to the attribute chart, the two graphs represent army-wide abilities and back-end tools. In the case of the Guard, army-wide refers to their regimental doctrines, and their back-end tools are comprised of their warlord trait, relic, stratagems, and regimental orders. Offensive efficiency relates to mechanics which offer performance increases relating to damage output. Offensive efficiency also informs shooting and melee propensities, so between the three you can read how a sub-faction's combat potency and preference skews. Defensive slash restoratives are just that, methods to mitigate damage or regain wounds. Flexibility refers to exceptions to core rules, and abilities to restrict enemy play. And it's worthy of note, factions with high flexibility will often have means of mitigating damage through control slash restrictions provided by those exceptions. However, unlike defensive qualities, they will require a higher skill floor to leverage. Mobility, in addition to visualizing how fast a sub-faction is, importantly informs how effective a sub-faction will be able to capitalize on their melee combat potential. And sub-factions, which score high in flexibility and mobility, will typically have a more dynamic playstyle. Relating to the secondary charts, they visualize the number of mechanics that pertain to those areas. Cast and Deny relates to mechanics which enhance reliability, or the amount of attempts which can be performed. Mortal Wounds and Leadership slash Morale mechanisms are pretty self-explanatory. To gain some context when looking at how sub-factions score, I have compiled the mean averages of all the sub-factions' attributes here charted in purple, with the dotted stroke. This is comprised of just the army-wide rules, since those are the rules that almost always carry more weight in characterizing the playstyle of a sub-faction. I will be starting off with the Goths clan, since they are the marketing face of the faction, and take it from there. For the Goths and all of the Orc clans, the publications used are their current 8th edition codex and Psychic Awakening supplement, Saga of the Beast. The Goths take on an extremely aggressive shape, quite apt for the archetypal Orc subfaction, with every single exclusive mechanic available to them supporting both offensive efficiency and melee propensity. Their clan culture, no mucking about, is purely geared towards boosting melee performance, granting them additional attacks for each natural hit roll of 6 which undoubtedly sees them score above the faction average in those areas. When it comes to their back-end tools, Goths take on a similar shape, but with a slight bump to mobility. Their Warlord trait proper Killy grants the Warlord plus one attack. According to the Orc Codex FAQ, it also improves the AP of their melee weapons. Everybody look here, an instance of improving mechanics tied to sub-factions. Keep that in mind for later. Their relic, the Lucky Stick, lets Goff characters add one to hit rolls in the fight phase, and lets the Bearer reroll hit and wound rolls. Their stratagem, Scar Boys, is an upgrade used before the game on a unit of boys, improving their strength of base 4 to 5. And their psychic power, Bull Charge, lets charge rolls which are less than 7 inches after modifiers count as 7. Unsurprisingly, the Orc Poster Boys have access to some unique characters, a total of 3. The first is the legendary Gazgul Thraka. 
Right off the bat, I should mention that Gaz does have a rule allowing him to be part of any orc clan detachment. Though he doesn't get their clan culture and he's keyworded goff, so it makes sense to talk about him here. As the epic character of the faction, Gaz is an absolute beast. 12 wounds with a 4 up invulnerable save, and he can only suffer 4 wounds a phase. He has between 5 and 7 attacks without his warlord trait and before any extra attacks from no mucking about, all using Gork's Claw, a minimum strength 10 AP 4 4 damage weapon. He's also equipped with Mork's Roar, a 12 shot strength 5 AP 1 1 damage assault weapon. He has a few notable abilities as well, one being an aura to add 1 to attacks for all orc infantry, as well as another melee force multiplier aura for goth units to reroll hit rolls of 1 for melee attacks. Next is Makari, an extremely lucky grot. His stabba, should it wound on a 6, deals d3 mortal wounds, and despite his appearance and 6 up armor save, he does have a very rare 2 up invulnerable save, protecting his 4 wounds. He also provides an aura giving goth units a 6 up feel no pain, but only if Makari is near Gazgul, along with an ability that boosts his movement allowing him to keep up with Gaz, and another ability letting Grot units use his leadership characteristic. Boss Zegstrux got a pretty great offering. His rocket pack gives him a 12 inch move with fly, the ability to deploy in reserves, and the ability to auto advance 6 inches, but if you roll a 1 he suffers one mortal wound. Offensively he has a Slugga, Choppa, and Blitz missiles, and Davulcha's claws, which while only limited to 3 attacks, they are fairly potent at strength 8 AP 3 dealing D3 damage and defensively he has a cyborg body giving him a 5 up feel no pain and an aura allowing goth storm boys to auto pass morale tests. On to the Bad Moons clan. Infamous for their obscene amount of firepower, they unsurprisingly take on a shape that supports offensive efficiency geared towards shooting propensity. On the army wide front, the Bad Moons clan culture, armed to the teeth, grants them the ability to reroll hit rolls of 1 in the shooting phase. I would like to point out that while this may appear underwhelming, it synergizes well with the orc's base rule, allowing more chances of proccing daka daka daka, a rule that mechanically uses luck to help orcs overcome their below average ballistic skill. And adding a probability boosting perk across the army compounds that effectiveness. Their back end tools are all split between enhancing shooting potency and increasing defense. Their relic, the Gobshot Thunderbuss, is an upgrade for shooter type weapons improving their stat profile and enabling them to fire a staggering amount of shots. Their stratagem, showing off, allows the unit to immediately shoot again. The value potential of this should be self-evident. Their warlord trait, the best armor Teeth can buy, gives the bearer a 4 up invulnerable save, and their psychic power, Gleeman Gear, allows a unit to add 1 to their armor saving throws. Next up, the Evil Sons, who exemplify the scientific fact that Red Ones do go faster. On the army wide front, the Evil Sons clan culture, Red Ones Go Fasta, is the first to provide multiple benefits. Those being increasing the move characteristic of models by 1 inch or 2 inches if they are a speed freak unit, the ability to add 1 to advance and charge rolls, and the ability to ignore the hit penalty for firing assault weapons while advancing. Overall, it's a strong set of benefits. More movement always provides utility, and since orcs like to fight, the bonus to charge is ideal, and the capacity to maintain accuracy while claiming the previous benefits is all the better. Their unique backend tools also offers perks in a variety of areas. Their warlord trait, Speed Freak, provides an aura allowing units to charge after falling back out of combat. Their relic, Redder Armor, grants the transport the bearer is embarked upon another plus one to their movement characteristic and the chance to deal mortal wounds to enemy units within 1 inch. Their stratagem, Drive by Crumpin, allows a unit to move again at the end of the shooting phase in exchange for being able to charge, which is excellent for moving away behind obscuring terrain, or moving even further to reach an objective you otherwise wouldn't be able to. And their psychic power, Visions and Smoke, psychs up a unit giving them full rerolls to hit until your next psychic phase. On to the superstitious Death Skulls clan. On the army wide rules front, the Death Skulls clan culture, Lucky Blue Gits, provides perks with the widest variety covered thus far. It provides a defensive perk to all units and a 6 up invulnerable save, literally allowing luck to save their skin. And each time a unit shoots or fights, they can reroll a single hit, wound, and damage roll, resulting in a Salamanders esque performance boost, but dialed up to the max. And it also gives all infantry units objectives secured, greatly enhancing the ease they will have in controlling objectives which is quite a powerful combination of perks from a single clan culture. Also keep that in mind for later. 
On the back end, the Death Skulls score high in offense, balanced between melee and shooting, with points in flexibility and a small bump in defense. Their Warlord trait, Opportunist, allows the bearer to reroll wound rolls of one versus vehicles, and the ability to circumvent Lookout Sir to target enemy characters within 18 inches. Their relic, the Fixer Upper, gives a unit the Big Mech ability to repair vehicles, or if given to a Big Mech, it improves the ability to repair flat 3 wounds instead of D3. Their Stratagem Wreckers allows a unit to reroll wound rolls for attacks that target vehicles. And their power, Maniacal Seizure, debuffs an enemy unit subtracting one from their hit rolls. And when attacking that unit, improves the AP of attacks made by Death Skulls. The Death Skulls have access to Mad Doc Grotznik, who is a named Painboy. His unique perks over the standard Painboy come in the form of his ability One Scalpel Short, which forces him to charge the nearest unit at the start of the charge phase, if he is both within 12 inches of an enemy unit and not within 3 inches of an orc infantry unit. He also has a cyborg body, giving him another layer of defense over the standard pain boy. Moving on to the most primal of the orc clans, the snake bites. And while it isn't my intention to turn this into a faction dissection slash critique, I would be remiss not to address the squigoth in the room. Despite the strong scoring in defense compared to the clans covered, snake bites are not the defensive orc subfaction. In fact, I would argue that the first perk of the Death Skulls culture offers a superior defensive mechanic. The Snake Bites clan culture, the old ways, gives the single perk of a 6-up feel no pain to ignore wounds. Compared to the Death Skulls and Evil Sons clan cultures, which offer multiple perks that are far more impactful, the old ways comes off rather underwhelming. And even compared to Goths and Bad Moons, which have single perk clan cultures as well, the perks they do offer go much farther thanks to them layering with the existing army-wide rules available to the orcs. Unfortunately, the same can be said about the Snake Bites. Which definitely strikes me as odd, since you would think GW would want the Snake Bites to be valid on the tabletop, as there is a lot of conversion potential via the Age of Sigmar range of orcs. However, as things stand, the Snake Bites probably have the most to gain when the Orcs eventually see their rules addressed for 9th edition. If you are a Snake Bites fan or player, please drop a comment below with what you would like to see as an appropriate subfaction rule for the Snake Bites. You would think, when a faction's army-wide ability is weaker than their contemporaries, their back-end tools would shore up that difference. And for the Snake Bites, it's a little hit and miss. For starters, their Warlord trait, Surly as a Squigoth, gives the Bearer an aura to let units within 6 inches reroll morale tests, and lets Grot units auto-pass morale. I mean, damn. why would anybody choose this over any of the generic Orc Warlord traits? Their relic, Brog's Buzz Bomb, is a once per battle 3d6 strength 5 AP-1 1, 1 damage grenade that can also hit another unit within 6 inches for 2d6 shots. It's pretty good. Their stratagem, Monster Hunters, allows all units to add 1 to wound rolls versus a single target with more than 10 wounds. In isolation, a mechanic to improve your wound rate is extremely valuable. However, for 3 command points, to give that perk across the army, tied to a single target, will be valuable in varying circumstances. And their psychic power, Constriction, halves the attack's characteristic of an enemy unit. Given how much more melee is present in 9th edition, this can really debilitate an enemy unit's combat potential. All said, the Snake Bites are a clan with a very unique thematic position. They are the Savage Orcs. And unfortunately, they have a toolkit that's vastly weaker than their rival clans. Which sucks. I've said it before, but I think it's worth repeating. When you don't have a supplement's worth of rules to justify a faction's use, every exclusive mechanic counts. And it's crucial that they be valid while speaking to their fluff. And if that isn't the case, it's incredibly demoralizing to long-term players slash collectors of that faction, which obviously should be something GW should try to avoid. Simply, you shouldn't want your customers to feel bad as a result of consuming your product. It's not a large leap in logic. Remember earlier when I pointed out how GW improved a subfaction rule for the Goths via an errata? Do that here. Do it. Next up, the duplicitous cunning orcs of the Blood Axes. The Blood Axes take on a shape focusing on flexibility with an even split in defense and shooting and melee propensities. On the army-wide front, their clan culture, Tactics, allows a unit to claim the benefits of cover if the attacking model is more than 18 inches away, which sees them score in defense. Their tactics also grants units the ability to either shoot or charge after falling back, allowing them to be more flexible on the whole compared to the other clans, 
leveraging melee or shooting as required. Looking to their back-end rules, all the Blood Axe's mechanics serve to further increase their flexibility. Their Warlord trait, I've Got a Plan, refunds command points spent on a 6-up. Their Relic, Morgog's Finken Cap, can only be given to your Warlord and gives them a second Warlord trait. Their Stratagem, Dead Sneaky, is used during deployment, allowing units to be deployed in reserves rather than starting on the battlefield. And their psychic power, Clever Talk, removes an enemy unit's ability to fire Overwatch and forces them to fight after all eligible Blood Axe units in the fight phase. The Blood Axes have access to Boss Snickrot, who is effectively a named Orc Commando. He possesses an above average stat line for an Orc at Strength 6, Toughness 5, with 6 wounds and attacks. Notably, he has all the abilities Commandos do, and additionally can add 3 to his saving throws while in cover, as well as allowing Commandos within 6 inches of him to reroll hit rolls of 1 in the fight phase. All in all, the Blood Axes are undoubtedly the most tactically flexible of the Orc clans. And finally, the Freebooters, who skew in offensive efficiency. Regrettably, for this extremely fun Orc clan, much of what was said about the Snake Bites can be said about the Freebooters as well. Their clan culture, Competitive Streak, allows a unit to add 1 to hit rolls if a freebooter unit within 24 inches has destroyed an enemy unit. By my standards, Competitive Streak is so close to being a great subfaction rule, though like many rules which are creative in their application, it stumbles over itself. The Wall of Flavor text speaks to the freebooter's reputation as being extremely mean-spirited and competitive, by orc standards, mind you. And to represent their competitive nature, their subfaction rule has that restriction before it can provide any value. The problem lies in the benefit gained. Specifically, plus one to hit rolls isn't all that potent. It certainly doesn't feel the meanest compared to the other clan cultures, and the perk behind its restriction just doesn't seem worthwhile when you see what the vast majority of other clans have restriction-free. I would personally like to see something far more impactful for a single perk behind a restriction. Maybe allow their perk to enable Daka 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 to go off in 5s and 6s for those units. To be honest, I'm spitballing here. But if you're a Freebooters fan or player, please drop a comment below with what you would like to see as an appropriate subfaction rule. On the back end, the Freebooters Warlord trait, Kill Our Reputation, gives the bearer an aura, allowing units to reroll hit rolls of 1 in melee. Their relic, the Bad Skull Banner, can be used once per battle in the morale phase to allow all Freebooters units to auto-pass their morale tests. Their stratagem, Kill Cruiser Broadside, allows you to deal mortal wounds in a radius, orbital bombardment style, at D3 positions on the battlefield. And their psychic power, Jolly Orc's Glare, debuffs an enemy unit, having their move characteristic and subtracting one from their advance and charge rolls. As a boon, the Freebooters have access to Captain Badruk, who is effectively a named Flashgit's HQ option. His ranged weapon, Da Ripper, is effectively a heavy 3-shot plasma gun with a base damage of 2 that can be supercharged to 3 damage. And he has a 5-up and vulnerable save thanks to his gold tooth armor, and Flash gets units near him can reroll hit rolls of 1 in the shooting phase. In review, here are the 7 orc clans. And as is customary, let's rank order them per attribute. Here they are organized by most efficient. Here they are organized by most flexible. By most defensive, most mobile, by melee propensity, and by shooting propensity. Well, that's a wrap on this one. Thanks for watching. These were my assessments slash rankings on the Orc clans. I hope you were able to find this video interesting, if not enjoyable. And if you have any questions or comments, feedback or suggestions, please drop them down below. So, if you enjoyed this video, there is a like button. And if you want to help my channel grow, there is a subscribe button. There is also a bell button and a share button, so press the buttons you want to press. Thanks again for watching, and I will hope to see you guys in the next one.